So, okay, welcome everyone to the statistics seminar. It is my greatest pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Ari Arias Castro. So, Ari is a, currently a professor at the at the University of San Diego, uh, University of California, San Diego, in the mathemat mathematics department. And Ari has worked and Ari has worked on all kinds of very exciting topics, including mean max hypothesis testing, multiple testing, clustering, dimension reduction, manifold learning, geometry, data analysis, or network analysis. And if you have ever worked on any of these topics, I believe that you, are, you will be familiar with one, some of his papers. <laughs> and because of his excellent research, and he has received numerous awards from National Science Foundations and also get a lot of awards from naval research. So today he's going to talk about a lot of very exciting topic about distance and, and the curvature and the manifold learning. So without further ado, Ari, let's thank welcome Ari. Thank you introduction. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to talk. So uh, let me just, okay, here are the slides. Okay, so it's a, um, it's a talk I've given a few times now on um, estimation of distances and how they can be, uh, that can be applied to the positioning uh, of uh, points uh, based on those distances, which is sometimes called multidimensional scaling in statistics, and also to manifold learning, uh, which is also known as uh, sometimes non-linear non dimensionality reduction. Uh, and I will uh, plug in a couple of other papers along the way that have something to do with this topic. Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, multiple papers uh, with multiple people uh, that sometimes overlap in some of the papers. Um, so without further ado, let me talk about uh, the basic problem, which is uh, the problem of embedding. Uh, typically done for visualization purposes, at least traditionally, and um, and what, what's called the exploratory data analysis. I haven't seen this really done in the con for actually improving, uh, for example, regression classification. Although I'm sure it, it's possible. Um, all right. So what is the graph embedding problem? We have a, a weighted graph um, and. Um, in a given dimension, that dimension, that dimension can sometimes not be given. Uh, often it is because uh, if it's for visualization purposes, then typically it's chosen to be two for obvious reasons. Uh, but sometimes it's not given. There are ways of uh, automatically selecting it. But I'm going to assume it's given. And uh, so the, the problem then becomes to find points in, in, in the Euclidean space or a Euclidean space of same dimension, let's say by the, you know, we are, we are at loss of generality RD, uh, such that the pairwise distances between, uh, between the, those points uh, is uh, close um, to uh, the weights between the corresponding um, nodes in the graph. Okay, so uh, this is perhaps a bit ambiguous, but the node set here V, the script V uh, has N nodes, uh, let's say one through N with the loss of generality and to I uh, in that set, we associate YI, okay? So it's in that sense that we want the points to sort of realize the nodes in a way that respects the, uh, the distance as much as possible. So in on the graph side, the distance given by this Delta on the Euclidean side is simply given by the Euclidean matrix. Okay. Uh, the most obvious way to perhaps approach the problem is to uh, uh, pose it as an optimization problem in terms of uh, minimizing the error sum of squares. And that has been done. In fact, it's one of the first things that's what, that was proposed, uh, I believe back in the 60s, 1960s. And it's known as, uh, sometimes known as matrix scaling. Uh, it turns out this is a high dimensional uh, non-convex optimization problem that's rather difficult. And that's sort of where it starts because then uh, many of the methods have been suggested for the same problem that try to do better. So why is it a high dimensional problem? It's because so let's say like a D is equal to two for visualization and again purposes. And uh, so how many variables do we have? So each point is two coordinates. And if we have N points, that's two times N. So we in fact have two times N uh, variables if we are embedding in dimension two, of course, if we're embedding in higher dimensions, we, we have even more variables. Okay, so it's, it's not an easy optimization problem. And even though you can try things like current descent, but they don't seem to work too well. So people have suggested other things and I come to that later. 
This problem is known as multidimensional scaling or MDS in statistics and uh, possibly comes from uh, uh, psycho uh, metrics. Um, and uh, at least some of the early work was done or published in Psychometrica, uh, a well-known journal in the field. And it's known under other names, depending on the community you're in, graph drawing, graph realization. Uh, and so this might be more in the computer science community. I'm not actually, I don't quite remember now, but you can distance matrix completion. That's one that arises in optimization. And the sensor index localization is one of the term, one of the terms that's uh, that's used in engineering. There are important connections to things I won't go into, and some of them quite deep. Uh, but one of them is uh, nearest neighbor search, which is of course a, a very large line of research. You know, embedding in finite metric spaces, which which typically is on, uh, done in the pure math side of things. And in mindful learning, this one I actually will develop. Sorry, this one I will develop later in the paper in in the presentation. Okay, so uh, let me start with actually when all the uh, the similarities are available, meaning the graph is complete. So uh, let's if I come back to this notation, it means that this e here is all the uh, the uh, so the the, the graph is uh, seem to be un, uh, not directed. And uh, in that case, E here is simply all the edges. So we say that the graph is complete in that case. Each edge has uh, the similarity attached to it given by delta. So in that case, uh, there is, um, if there is an exact solution, meaning the, the graph is exactly realizable in a Euclidean space, again, meaning that there is a point set Y1 through Yn such that the pairwise, uh, all pairwise Euclidean distances correspond to um, the, the, the similarities were given, um, then uh, there is a method that solves, that provides a solution. Uh, there's not, the solution cannot be unique because it's up to uh, an invariance um, by the orthogonal, so by the uh, rigid group. Um, but anyway, uh, up to that, um, classical scaling provides a solution. And, um, and this is a method that dates back to the 50s, in fact. Um, and it's a very convenient one. I don't think I have it here displayed for you, but it's a well-known method that essentially amounts to performing a single value decomposition or, or eigenvalue decomposition. And so this is one, my first plugin is, uh, we actually worked with um, Adel Javan Mar and Bruno Pelke on this problem. Uh, this is a very old method, but there was no per actual perturbation band for it. Uh, and we actually got one. There were some uh, tailored developments uh, in the 70s by Simpson and more recently in a, a fairly well cited preprint by De Silva and Tenenbaum uh, in 2004. They had tailored developments, but even in, that, for example, in that paper in 2004, they had, the authors uh, asked for an actual perturbation, which is what we provided. Um, in a recent paper. So uh, what is the perturbation bound? It means that uh, if, so uh, the way we formulate it at least is that we have uh, a situation that's exactly realizable. So there's a point set that realizes uh, the graph. And then we, uh, we add noise to the uh, graph dissimilarities and we apply classical scaling, uh, which we can always do uh, here, assuming that the graph is complete. And uh, we look at the, the point set that's been returned from that. And uh, we see how far it is up to a rigid transformation from the original point set. Okay, so let's consider a, a center point set Y1 through Yn in RD, okay, and, uh, of uh, radius. This is a half diameter row and half width uh, o, uh, omega. And delta Ij are the pairwise Euclidean distances. This is not what we observe. What we observe is a noisy version of that. So we observe, uh, so we are still in the multidimensional uh, scaling problem uh, setup. So we observe pairwise similarities and the ones we observe are the lambdas here. And the lambdas are, well, in principle, not too far away apart from the deltas and that's quantified with this eta here. So eta is essentially the, uh, the square root so you know, if you take the uh, the fourth root here, it would be something like um, 
uh, you know, like some sort of like a variance, but in 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 in, in square. So like, uh, it's 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 a uh, it's a measure of how far the, the the lambdas are from the deltas, and so therefore eta quantifies the noise level. Okay. And it goes like this. So if eta is not too large, uh, this is compared to the half width, which is of course always uh, less than or equal to the, the radius or half diameter. Then classical scaling with uh, provided with those lambdas and dimension D, so the actual, the, the accurate dimension returns a uh, centered uh, point set so center is always is by construction of um, is what the classical scaling returns um, uh, point set so uh, z1 through zn in that in that uh, Euclidean space such that uh, up to rotation so if so a rigid transformation is essentially a, a orthogonal transformation and the translations translations taken care of because the point sets are both centered so all we care about is the uh, the, the orthogonal group here Okay, so up to a uh, orthogonal transformation, we get an, an, an error, an average error on the order of eta squared. Okay, and then the, uh, the constant A here is explicit. So, okay, so that's fine. This is when all distances are available, uh, but what if uh, not all distances are available? So an obvious strategy is uh, to estimate the distances and plug them into classical scaling and that's one of the strategies that was proposed early on. There, there have been other strategies since then. In fact, this one here, direct optimization and applying something like grand descent is a possibility as well. Like I said, it doesn't seem to work well, but uh, it's another very distinct possibility. Okay, so let's consider that case uh, where uh, again, some dissimilarities are missing now. The graph is not complete anymore. And there's this question um, that uh, some there's some literature on that people in, in, in mostly pure math uh, have tackled, which is of uh, whether uh, the the, um, the graph can be determined based on the av available dissimilarities up to uh, some invariance, and that's that falls in the in the, in the uh, under the umbrella name of rigidity theory. Okay, but here we want to go beyond that. Here we add the algorithmic or methodological uh, level, and we want to actually look at methods that are uh, useful for this problem. Okay, so like I said, the number of methods have been proposed. Uh, the first one is the one I described in words just now, which is uh, filling in the missing distances in some way, and then applying classical scaling. So the, the main way I've seen this done is through graph distances. And it's a method that dates back, is the oldest one, if you see here, that I know of, um, and dates back to uh, Kruskal and Siri in uh, 1980. Um, okay. by, by comparison, classical scaling was proposed uh, in the, I think, early to mid 50s by Torgerson. Uh, so this came a good amount of time later. Okay, um, that's one possibility. Another possibility is uh, to embed a click. So click is a, a subgraph that's uh, complete. So we know that we can apply classical scalings. We have all, if it's complete, we have the corresponding dissimilarities available to us and we can use them to embed the click. And uh, I guess dimension two or whatever the, the, the dimension that uh, has been pre-specified pre for us. And, and then once the click is, uh, is uh, embedded, then it can it can serve as as if anchor or or landmark for the other ones. And the way uh, the other ones, the other nodes are embedded is uh, by trilateration. Uh, that's a possibility. Uh, so trilateration is essentially the same as triangulation, but instead of using angles, use distances. And so uh, this is not a, this method is not always available, but it is available. It's not hard to see if the the, the graph is fairly dense. Um, like in a uh, sort of like something like a random geometry graph. Um, uh, um, that's that sort of fairly, uh, that sort of dense enough. And this sort of thing would be available and actually has been shown to be the case by Aaron and collaborators uh, in 2004, if not earlier than that. Okay. That one is pretty greedy because uh, the only one click serves as an anchor and then the other points uh, flow from that. 
there is one that's a bit less uh, less uh, greedy, which is that uh, a bunch of clicks are um, embedded. In general, you can even uh, go beyond clicks and embed all uh, rigid subgraphs uh, in the graph that we're provided with. So those we know we can embed uh, essentially uniquely up to an orthogonal transformation, uh, sorry, a um, rigid transformation. And once we have a bunch of them, we effectively, all we can, all we can do uh, is to um, embed them in separate spaces and we have to, as if bring them together by aligning them or synchronizing them. So there's a bunch of uh, proposals of this sort. Um, and in fact, I'm missing the main one. I'm, I know a, a bit more about. Um, so Sheng and Rommel has one, they have one like that. So it sort of mixes the two of them. Sorry, uh, this one and this one. Okay. Then uh, uh, there's also the option of solving the optimization problem, the matrix scaling problem uh, by, well, grand descent would be one option, but people have done better since then. And there's a relatively well known method that's called Smackoff, which uses majorization instead. And last but not least uh, are uh, uh, the class of uh, SDP methods. Uh, that proposes a semi-infinite programming relaxation. Um, and perhaps the most well-known among them is maximum variance unfolding proposed by uh, Killian Weinberger and, 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 and others, including a, a colleague of mine here at UCSD, Lorenz Saul, um, around the same time, actually 2004 as well. It's, it's really closely related to, uh, it turns out, to the method of cruise call and Siri, but in this guys, in this one here. Any questions so far? Yeah, I think I think currently no other questions. <laughs> okay, great. So I'll just move forward. So here's an illustration of using graph distances. So imagine this is the this is simulated. It's kind of obvious. Uh, this this is a point set in dimension two. So I start. So the and you can you could visualize this as the nodes of the graph, but there are there are as you can see points in the plane, uh, and the available uh, the similarities which are the pairwise distances are those that I uh, uh, depict here with a with a line segment. Okay, so this all I did was essentially simulate a random geometric graph in some area. I can't remember where where it was, but perhaps something like a rectangle like this. And suppose that we want to compute, uh, sorry, we want to yes, estimate the, uh, the distance between those two points that are square, uh, red squares, this one and this one. And this method, again, uh, possibly first proposed by Krusko and Siri in 1980, is uh, to um, do so by computing the shortest path distance, meaning the distance in the graph uh, between those two points and, and using that as the estimate between the uh, for the distance between the two points, which is here in purple, or that would be the length of this line segment. And it's not hard to, to, to see why it should work in this particular setting. And it's also not so, so hard to see, uh, to envision situations in which it won't work. Uh, I'll, I'll come to that in a second. Okay, so what are graph distances? Uh, most people here would know, but uh, so remember Delta gives us the uh, pairwise dissimilarities or um, the, the, the weights in the graph uh, and the graph distances. So if we take two nodes i and j, then the graph distance within i and j is the following. You, take, you consider in principle all paths that go from i to j. If none exist, then the distance is just uh, said to be infinite. But if at least one exists, then you do the following. You go over uh, all of them. And for each one of them, you look at, um, uh, the it's uh, so-called weight or, or length really, which is the uh, uh, the sum of the uh, the dissimilarities along the way. Uh, uh, you know, sequent uh, looking at the edges that form the the path, and uh, and then you take the infimum of all of all the set of paths. That's what the graph distance is between i and j. Okay, so this is uh, yeah. That's fine. And like I said, it's available even if uh, some of the points are not connected to each other. So in that case, the graph is said to be disconnected, then some of the distances in that case are infinite. That's fine. Of course, in that case, uh, there are some issues, but uh, I don't think they're avoidable in a sense. Okay, so um, 
So, so a case in point is the uh, that of neighborhood graphs, and that's more or less what people in engineering call sensor network localization. That's the setting they, they probably have in mind the most because it's related to a Wi-Fi communication between the nodes that may exchange information as to where they are relative to each other. Um, and um, yeah, so suppose that as in the example, I just showed you a picture early, the, the graph is an arbol neighborhood graph. And um, yeah, and so actually, I guess the truth now is X1 through Xn uh, and it's in the mission RD and D for us will be known, okay? So and this means that as you, you must know, like I and J um, is uh, a, 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 an edge in the graph if and only if uh, the uh, distance between I and J um, which is also the uh, is given by the Euclidean distance between the corresponding points is less than or equal to R. Okay. So this is a very simple uh, setting, and we obtained uh, a sharper bound that uh, existed somehow. Um, so if we have uh, that point set and we define uh, how dense it is in its convex hull, so this x here. Is the same as here. So this uh, for little x here uh, ranges in the convex hull of the point set, and epsilon quantifies how far this little x is from an actual uh, data point, okay, or uh, I guess node in the graph really. So uh, if, um, in other words, the method is going to work well, and um, I'm talking about estimating uh, the Euclidean distances by and the ones that are missing in particular by the graph distances. And method is gonna work well if the point set is dense in its convex hull. For in that case, uh, for example, if epsilon over R is small enough, then, well, we have this bound always because uh, a path uh, in the graph, a uh, finite distance, uh, it can also be represented by a polygonal line between the two corresponding points. And the polygonal line we know has a length at least the uh, the Euclidean distance in between xi and xj because uh, the straight line is, is, is the shortest path in, in Euclidean space. Okay, so this inequality is always true. Uh, so there's no 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 brain power in this one, and here uh, that's the one we refined a little bit. Uh, so there's also an upper bound again. Uh, so here the Euclidean distance bound from above by uh, the graph distance, and here the graph distance bound from above by Euclidean distance except for uh, a multiplicative factor um, uh, of the form one plus something on the order of epsilon over R squared. Uh, and it turns out that uh, what was known until then, even though this result is relatively simple, uh, like a page of proof apps, um, before the, uh, the result that was available was without the square here. Okay, so this brings us actually the one of the people that proved this are the people that provided some theory for isomap, which is uh, one of the best known manifold learning methods. And that brings me to actually considering that situation. So estimating some distances on a surface now, as opposed to uh, like in this result here, we're not on the surface, otherwise there's no hope that, unless the surface is flat, there's no hope that epsilon will be small uh, because you know the convex hull is flat. Okay, so now estimating surface the distance on, on the surface, um, and that's that one of so that I'm sure people in robotics might have considered this before, but uh, it came to my attention at least uh, when uh, when that was done in the context of isomap, which is, so isomap works as follows: uh, you uh, compute you, you have so what is manifold learning first of all. Uh, manifold learning, I don't think I have a sound that, no. So manifold learning is I have, we have points in space now as opposed to a, a graph. So we have points in space as in, so the difference is really the same as in, you know, multidimensional scaling and principal components analysis, right? Uh, multidimensional scaling, we don't have points. We only have a graph that we want to embed as a set of points in a Euclidean space, so respecting the, uh, the metric as much as possible. That's on one side, that's multidimensional scaling. On the other side, we have uh, dimensional reduction. The most famous method there is principal components analysis. And there we have points in space in higher dimensions that we want to embed as points in, in also in Euclidean space, but of lower dimension while respecting the metric as much as possible, the metric between the points. 
Okay. Somehow, uh, I'm not sure why, but somehow MDS and PCA are confused uh, at, at, at all levels, including in textbooks, but they don't address the same problem, right? MDS, you feed a graph, a weighted graph, and PCA, you feed a, a point set instead. Okay. They are connected, by the way, but um, so classical scaling is connected to PCA, but um, the, the problems themselves, uh, MDS and uh, dimensionality reduction, are not the same. Okay, so all that being said, manifold learning is uh, the same as essentially dimensional vector reduction, but now the key assumption, as opposed to PCA, where we assume if we want it to work well, we assume that the points are near an affine uh, surface. In manifold learning, we, uh, the, the, the key assumption is that we assume the, the points are near a uh, curved surface. So, uh, which uh, in principle would be a uh, manifold if it doesn't intersect itself and that sort of thing. Okay, so how does uh, Isomap work? Uh, Isomap works as follows. So uh, it, um, it estimates uh, the, uh, the distances on the surface with the graph distances in a R ball neighborhood graph where R is chosen by the user. So it's a tuning parameter, the only tuning parameter of the method if the, dimension, the, the embedding dimension is known or given. So yeah, so I haven't chosen a R uh, it, it builds the R neighborhood graph, computes the uh, graph distances. Those, the intention for that is to estimate the, uh, the distances on the surface and then uh, applies classical scaling to get on, on the obtained graph distances to obtain an embedding in the desired dimension. That's how isomap works. So effectively the second part there, after the, the graph is built, the second part is the method by Kruskal and Siri, meaning the one that uh, fills in the distance matrix by computing graph distances and applying classical scaling. Uh, the, the authors of Isomap didn't know that, but it's been like a crisscross between the two fields, uh, between uh, MDS and, and dimensionality reduction. There's a, uh, an overlap and uh, uh, in, 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 uh, rediscovering each other's work and that sort of thing. There are other examples of that. So, um, okay. Uh, there's also, uh, so uh, estimating uh, distances on surfaces is also uh, something that people in motion planning are also interested in, although, although uh, they're mostly interested in the, the Euclidean case in which you have a boundaries given by obstacles. But anyway, so uh, here's the problem. We have a, a set uh, S and intrinsic distance is simply what you think it is, which is that you uh, take two points. So define between two points uh, on, on that set and uh, you look at all curves on the set uh, that uh, join the two points. If there's none, then you say the distance is infinite. If there is at least one, you look at uh, the length of the shortest one. And that's, that's the intrinsic distance between those two points on that surface. This is the way to write it, but that's, that's what I said in words, it's the same thing. And uh, so under some basic assumptions on S, um, we, we, we want to estimate uh, the uh, all the pairwise. So if we have a, a sample x1 to xn on that surface, well, we want to estimate all the pairwise uh, intrinsic distances, sometimes called geodesic distances. But there's a uh, there's a bit of a uh, ambiguity. So I'm going to use intrinsic distances. Okay. So uh, we're going to use again um, a graph distances. But here uh, we are not provided with a graph. We have to build it. So we do the same as in isomap. So we build a uh, R ball neighborhood graph and, um, and then we compute the graph distances which we uh, use as proxies for the actual uh, intrinsic distances on the surface S. S is unknown to us, obviously. Otherwise in principle, we could, we could compute the, all the pairwise uh, intrinsic distances, at least in principle, okay? So here uh, the key uh, quantity which also measures how dense the point set is and somewhere, but it's not in the convex set. Uh, I want to say obviously again, because we're not in the flat situation, but it's uh, how dense the point set is on the surface. But otherwise this epsilon plays the same role as it did before. And the people that uh, came up with isomap uh, soon after they have this uh, famous preprint, which somehow remains a preprint uh, where they provide some, um, they provide some, a theory for isomap in the form of uh, essentially quantifying how well this does for estimating distances. 
And uh, so here's one thing they came up with. So we, we actually recovered their result. That's what we do. And then I'll explain a bit more. Uh, so if, if the epsilon over R is small enough, just the just same condition as before, then the graph distances are bounded from above by the intrinsic distances times uh, a factor of one plus something in epsilon over R. So essentially there's a multiplicative error of order epsilon over R from above, okay? To have, so this is with very few assumptions on S, by the way, uh, with uh, uh, further assumptions on S and the main one pass being that uh, the S is smooth. So one way to, to say that is that uh, the shortest paths on S have curvature bounded by kappa. And which is the case, for example, if you, if S is a, uh, say uh, twice differentiable many, uh, so actually C two manifold uh, that's compact or something like that. Um, so okay, so in that in, uh, so assuming something like this, uh, the same group of authors, Bernstein and, and others, in two thousand, I think that the ones are the Silva, Tenenbaum, and Langford. Um, they uh, they also have uh, a a complementary bound. So the, uh, um, the graph distances are bounded from below by the intrinsic distances uh, modulo a multi multiplicative error of order R squared if R is small enough relative to the uh, curvature radius of essentially the curvature radius of S. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, sorry. There's also that's no, right. The Tau that's, that's true, but also if um, this is so that doesn't bridge the uh, some parts that are you know bridge S essentially, uh, and then the, the other one is the uh, this one here that relates to this kappa here. So we want also small relative to uh, uh, so small relative to one over kappa, which is the uh, the curvature radius, maximum curvature radius of those of those storage paths on S. Okay, so this is all good. And what we do in this paper, uh, we do other things. And the main thing we do is coming next. But one thing we do is we recover uh, this bound uh, is uh, just the constant is not quite as sharp as the uh, the nice results obtained here by Bernstein and others that we do it uh, very shortly, very quickly based on, although based on similar work of Dubin's on motion planning uh, on the plane. Um, which I thought was we were it was kind of cute to do, but the main thing we do is um, is this that we look at curvature constraint shortest paths. So uh, this is essentially the same question, but now we ask uh, what is the shortest distance between x and x prime on S again on the surface S, uh, but now uh, we insist on using a path that has curvature at most kappa. So this is relevant again in motion planning. If you're driving a vehicle like a car that has a, a strict bound, uh, strict lower bound on its curvature radius, so a strict upper bound on its uh, on its curvature. Oh, sorry, on, on the on the curvature it will leave as a when you, when you drive a car. Okay, and uh, otherwise the question remains the same. So for this, what we did is also look at graph distances, but now uh, we look at them as uh, polygonal curves and uh, we want to restrict them to not have too much curvature. It's very natural to do that so that we can do some sort of plug-in. Uh, and, um, and we looked for notions of curvature that were useful to us. Uh, sorry, uh, notions of, of discrete curvatures that were, uh, that were uh, useful to us. So by discrete curvatures, I mean curvature, uh, notions of curvature that apply to polygonal lines. So of course the polygonal line at each one of its apexes or, or um, um, I forget how you call them. Um, they, uh, the, the curve is obviously has uh, infinite curvature unless it's perfectly aligned there. And, um, and so, uh, no, like the, we, we talked about the, uh, replacing the usual notion of curvature with another one that sort of resembles what we want, what we want it to be expressing, which is how much a polygonal line is turning, really. So the notion we came up with, which later we found in literature, but immediately we didn't find this one. We found other ones that were not as useful because they were based on angles. Uh, this is the one we found. 
let me explain actually in a, with a figure uh, what what the notion is. So here's the polygonal line. Suppose we want to uh, define the curvature at this uh, node right here. Then uh, we consider the adjacent nodes. Sorry, node is not the right word, but the anyway. Um, so here are the adjacent ones, and even though the curve could be uh, in dimension five, uh, to this those three points are always in the plane. They, they are always on the plane and uh, uh, of dimension two. And we consider the circle that uh, they define and uh, one over the radius is a curvature at this point right here. That's how we define the curvature. Modulo the fact that if the angle is more than, so uh, here is fine, but if the angle is uh, square or less, then we make the, uh, the curvature infinite. Otherwise, there's some technicalities that arise. Okay, so that's the notion we're going to use, and otherwise, that's what we do. So um, I come back to that later, perhaps. Okay, so okay, it's right here. So what we do is um, so actually we also use an analyst graph as opposed to our ball graph. This is for technical reasons. It's, it doesn't seem to be quite necessary, but in our proofs, we it was useful to consider an analyst graph. So an analyst graph is. Uh, one in which, uh, well, you start with an R-ball neighborhood graph and then you remove some of the shorter edges. So here, something like we can remove, say, uh, the edges that are of length less than R over four if we use uh, an R-ball uh, neighborhood graph. And, and the, the, our estimates are, um, uh, so the, the, so our estimate for the, for the distance, um, the intrinsic distance on S between X and X prime with curvature bound by kappa uh, pointwise, is the uh, the graph distance between x and x prime uh, um, in this graph and this uh, r ball r neighborhood uh, analyst graph, uh, but with uh, the polygonal line defined by the path uh, having curvature as defined earlier bounded by kappa. That's essentially what we do. Uh, why this notion of curvature is interesting? Let me just say a couple of things. So one is that it behaves more or less as we, we hope it does. So the, the most obvious, uh, simplest lemma to show is this one here. So if you take a, a curve that's twice continuously differentiable, so we can define your curvature everywhere. And this is called gamma, is between, defined between A and B. And then uh, we take a point S in A and B and, and uh, keep it fixed while we have uh, uh, another location R coming from below and location T coming from above. So really the location should be those here. So this is before, so this gamma S in the middle, gamma R and gamma T on both sides. S remains fixed, so this point in the middle remains fixed and we let R come, so this point approaches this one in the middle, this point approaches the one in the middle. Then the curvature, um, the discrete curvature uh, on this side uh, tends to the curvature of gamma at S. So that's reassuring. And not all notions of curvature actually uh, have that. And the, uh, so this is a, uh, as if asymptotic or you know, limiting result, but we have a finite uh, distance or like a fixed result, which is the following. And that was quite useful to us is that if we take a curve so similar that has a curvature as most, a most cap, and now we quantify it. This is a more quantitative result. That's what I meant to say. And then we take two, uh, sorry, three points uh, on gamma, such that y is between is a center point, so between x and, and and z on gamma, and x is not too far from z relative to the curvature to the radius of curvature of, of gamma. Then the, the uh, this polygonal curvature that we defined is bounded by kappa and kappa is this the same kappa here that uh, bounds the uh, curvature of gamma pointwise everywhere. And that, that was useful to us. Okay, so now coming back to this problem of estimating those intrinsic distances, uh, how close is this How close is this, this estimate from the actual intrinsic distances with, with the curvature constraint? So we have a first result uh, this is the easy one uh, where, uh, again, so epsilon has the same meaning as before. It quantifies how dense the point set is on the surface. And the surface now is also assumed to have uh, enough smoothness that, that the intrinsic distances are 
have curvature bound by kappa everywhere. So if epsilon over r is small enough and r, r itself is small enough relative to, the, to that one over kappa, and so uh, I sort of lied just a second ago, like we don't use kappa for uh, the, the constraint, the curvature constraint on, on the polygonal lines, we use kappa prime, which is slightly larger than kappa. If you see it's kappa plus something that's small, when r and epsilon over r is small, sorry, epsilon over r square is small, then we have this sort of bound that we've seen before, which is that uh, the uh, graph distances, the so constraint graph distances are bounded from above by the actual constraint distances, intrinsic distances, modulo or multiplicative error of order epsilon over r. And the other, uh, so to obtain the other bound, we actually did it in a, uh, in a different way. Um, what we did is the following. Uh, we showed that uh, the unconstrained shortest paths uh, are uh, on, um, uh, in the graph, they already obey uh, a uh, curvature constraint. Uh, this is again, assuming that the surface is smooth enough. And uh, the curvature constraint is essentially kappa, except for uh, something that's small, but now if uh, epsilon over r cube is small. And we don't know if this is, uh, so here we had the constraint that epsilon of the r squared has to be small. And here we have that epsilon of the r cube has to be small for this to work. And we don't know if those things are uh, unavoidable or not. There's not a whole lot of literature on this problem, if any, really. Um, okay, any, any questions at all? Uh, okay, so, so far, actually, no, so. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I, I actually, I personally, I actually have one question. And so, so when you define the polygonal curvatures, I think in the case of a graph, it's actually not unique for every point on the graph, right? Because you could have multiple curves. If you are thinking about picking three points, even for the center points fixed, you could have different ways of defining that, right? Yeah, so we don't define it for the points. We define it for paths, for, for polygonal lines. I see, I see. So it's for, for the paths, I see. So for given paths. Yeah. Okay. So the same way, like, uh, you know, if you have a point on the plane, you don't define a curvature for that point, right? You define a curvature in the context of a curve that goes through that point. Right. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Oh, Sorry yeah, if I wasn't clear there enough, but yeah. Oh, there's a question from Ikun. So, so the question is that I was wondering if the curvature of the space on which the point slice can be negative. So not here, uh, we, you know, we look at the absolute value of, you know, like, so we don't, we don't put any sign to the curvature. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think so. Okay, great. So currently no other questions. So I think I can move on. So I only have a few more minutes. So let me, um, let me see what I will. So this is more natural to cover next. So um, this is more recent work with a student of mine so actually, I should have said that this previous work is with uh, Thibault Le Guic. Um, and now moving on to some work that they did with a uh, current student, Alan Cho, uh, who, uh, so together we looked at um, the embedding problem again. And so two things actually, how, how well can we estimate the, the, the distances? Can we get something like a minimax result? And, and then uh, what are the implications for, for, manifold, for, for manifold learning? Okay, so the similar question, but from a minimax point of view, really. Okay, so suppose, so we make very, if we make a very, a relatively strong assumptions, I mean, quite a, actually quite strong, that we're saying that S, the underlying surface is isometric to a convex domain, which is exactly the condition that uh, isomap, for example, requires to be uh, consistent. And it's also the case for other methods such as maximum variance and folding. So it's a strong uh, condition, but it's also the sort of things that's necessary in the manifold learning literature, at least. So, if we combine the uh, the results of uh, like we've seen actually in, the, in this uh, in this presentation, we get and we optimize over the choice of little r. Remember that in manifold learning, we do have the choice of little r. If we optimize, then we get that. Uh, so now I'm I'm back to the case where uh, there's no curvature constraint. Okay, so I'm only uh, looking at estimating the intrinsic distances. Okay, so uh, again, under relatively strong conditions, following the bounds that we had, and including a refinement that uh, I showed you earlier, then 
we we get that the relative error is uh, on the order of epsilon. That's what uh, the graph distances offer um, in terms of precision. And uh, so, of course, the natural question is whether this is optimal or not, or we can do better. So, if you're if you want to you know quantify this in terms of sample size, know that if you have a point that say I the uniform on the surface S then uh, SN will be on the order of, uh, of log, uh, especially for the kind of surface we're looking at, SN will be on the order of log n over n to power one over the URD as a, the, uh, the dimension of the surface, okay? So, uh, so is this a rate, if you want, key estimation rate, or just like, uh, you know, infinite, infinite uh, this finite bound here, is that optimal or, or, or not? If not, can we do better? So suppose now that, uh, so, you know, when, you, when this is a relatively easy case, but suppose that we, we don't, we want to go beyond this. Many times people assume that the S does not have a boundary uh, because, you know, dealing with boundaries is always a bit of a, of a pain, frankly. So we otherwise make a, a fairly common assumptions. So compact connect, so manifold with a boundary and I think positive reach. So positive reach is essentially the same as, actually it is exactly the same in this context as, uh, submanifold compact connected that ha that's uh, twice differentiable okay and the reach in that case will be one over the maximum curvature okay so we found that uh, in fact this is not optimal this epsilon here is not optimal but we can get in this context epsilon squared so we believe we can get also epsilon squared in this context which is uh, a bit different because if it's isometric to convex domain and s has a boundary uh, but um, we are and as long as uh, not as just as a metric, but also it is smooth, it's a submanifold, then we actually believe that uh, we can get epsilon square, but having dealing with the boundary has us do some hand waving though. But otherwise, if we don't have a boundary to deal with, we're able to show that uh, we can do better. So we can go from epsilon to epsilon squared. And the estimate, uh, yeah, sorry. And, and one more thing is that not only uh, we can do better, but actually the epsilon square we can achieve is uh, minimax optimal. And uh, the idea is very simple. In fact, it was suggested to us by uh, um, um, uh, someone else when we when actually I gave a talk like this a few years ago. Um, and um, uh, so Amit Moskovic, somehow his name was escaping me. He uh, he suggested something of the sort, which uh, with the uh, with uh, Anna we developed, and uh, it's very natural. It's um, reconstructed, so it's it's also computationally much heavier than what Tizomap does, but it's feasible. Um, so the idea is to reconstruct the surface, and it's called S hat, and then simply compute the uh, the distances on S hat uh, now serving as proxies for the distances on S. Very, very natural. And it turns out to, uh, um, if the approximation is of sufficient order, which is possible in this context, then we get uh, an, a much better rate of epsilon squared as opposed to epsilon. So we have a couple of results. One is not in the paper. One, one is non-constructive in which uh, S hat is simply, we sort of effectively, uh, uh, use the axiom of choice and to pick a surface that's close enough that sort of goes through the points and uh, ha, you know satisfies um, the same constraints as S essentially. And the other one is constructive. Uh, for this, we leverage the uh, substantial literature on, on meshes, and in both cases, we're able to to show that uh, we can uh, we can achieve it sound squared. Here are some experiments uh, using meshes. So I think this is a Delaunay uh, triangulation, uh, but based on the so-called uh, tangential complex. Um, so I don't know if I can zoom in. Yeah, I can do a little, a little bit of that. Oops. Sorry. There we go. So uh, in red, I think, is the graph distances. In blue is the one obtained by uh, by uh, using this mesh reconstruction and green is the actual actual one. And this is for torus, so we can compute those things. Okay, uh, right. And uh, so actually this also led us to propose a, a variant of isomap, 
which is uh, what you probably think it should be, which is that we reconstruct the surface uh, using a mesh and then simply uh, compute the distances and then apply classical scaling to obtain an embedding. And that's what we call mesh isomap. And by waving some hands, because there are again, potential issues at the boundary, it seems that we obtain uh, a, a much better error rate of epsilon square, which, uh, which, is the optimal, which is the minimax optimal rate. This we know, the second part we know, but I mean, we know we cannot do better, but we believe that this, uh, this, this variant called mesh isomap obtain, uh, achieves this error of epsilon square. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop here. Uh, there are a couple of things I'm gonna mention very quickly. One is uh, we, uh, with, another, with another student who's finishing his PhD in France uh, with somebody else, but he, he visited as a master student. We looked at constructing random paths that have a bound curvature based on this uh, notion of uh, discrete curvature I, I, I showed earlier, something that looks like this, as opposed to something like integrating twice the brain motion. So it looks better, I think. And the other thing I, 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 I was potentially uh, at least contemplating uh, sharing with you was uh, another uh, variant of multidimensional scaling in which uh, the weights are missing. So we only have the adjacency matrix and uh, we asked the question as to whether, of course, under some assumptions, whether we can still recover uh, the set of points. Uh, uh, and uh, that's in a different paper with uh, a different set of collaborators. I'm going to leave it here and, uh, and, and stop. And thank you again for, for coming and, and attending this, call, this talk. Thank you so much, Eric. And any questions from the audience? So while people are composing questions, so I actually I have a couple of questions. It's very exciting and very inspiring work. So one question I have is that I do notice I, I notice that sometimes when you like the distortion rate, like when you're comparing the two two metrics, the distortion rate sometimes like square, sometimes linear, like epsilon over r square, sometimes linear. So is there any yeah. intuitions of why? My, my, I guess it's probably related to the curvature, but is there any other in, intuitions on that? No, you're completely right. So this one, the square here is, is uh, related to the curvature exactly. So it's, it's an order two approximation. So this one requires an order two approximation, yeah. I see. Actually, I should be more precise. It's really an order one approximation that so then the remainder is of, is of order two. So I don't know if it's an order one or order two, but it's accurate <laughs> uh, at, so the surfaces, so for the surface S hat, sorry. For the surface S hat, which is an approximation meant to be an approximation of S, right? Mm -hmm. For that to be uh, useful and, and yield, not just useful, but yield a, uh, an error bound, uh, which is of order epsilon squared, S hat has to be accurate, not just has to be close to S in the of distance, but also its tangents have to be close to those of S, right? right. Okay. Yeah. So it's exactly what you have in mind. It's exactly where it comes from. The other one is a bit more complex. Uh, why, why here epsilon? <laughs> I'm actually not sure why, like I, that's a good question. I don't know if I have a good intuition as to why, what, what's, what's not, I'm going to say, I don't know here. I don't know. I don't know why, what fails here. And then we only get it sound. Um, uh, okay. I guess it's question, right? some approximation turns, I guess, like, yeah. Can I really get, get over that? That's my, somehow, that's my, my yeah. Thing. Yeah. Somehow, um, if you look at, so if you look at the experiment, at least well, that's in finite samples, I don't know if it's that informative, but you can really cut, cut much more across. Uh, so this one is just, you know, this point and this point were directly related in the, so this is the Dillon triangulation, but it doesn't tell you what the uh, neighborhood was, but I'm, I think it was about this size box. So this point and this point are related, this point and this point are, are, are directly na direct neighbors, this one and this one, this one, this one. Uh, but with the with the other one, you can really cut a, a, across triangles in a sense uh, when you use um, the uh, distances on the on the mesh, and uh, that seems to have having uh, yeah that seems to have an impact. Yeah, I see. Sorry, I see. I'm, it's a very good question. I don't I don't have a good answer for it. Thanks, thanks. So actually, I have another question. Like I I know that most of this the, the bound you derive are like. Uh, so in a sense, because I think this epsilon quantity, like the minimal projection distance in the entire support or the nearest point, if the data is uniformly distributed, then in a sense, like large sample size can decrease that in a relatively fast way. But of course we know it's like one over D, that's a still very slow rate. But what I think that in reality, if we have some point that has a higher density and lower density regions, then it turns out that I think the approximation, the distance is going to get more distorted in the low density region compared to the high density regions. That's right. right. 
That's right. right. So I was thinking that, uh, so do, do people actually think about something like an average dist? Because that's like, I, I know like the bound we derive, you derive is like the, like it's trying to apply for every pair of point. But right. then, so I was curious, like do people also like, maybe sometimes we don't care about the worst case. Maybe also sometimes of interest is the majority case or the average case, the average yeah. problem. So I'm just curious, yeah. Yeah, we didn't consider it, but I think whatever you have in mind uh, should work. Like, um, so you could think of, uh, you know, like if uh, two, you have two points and then their path does it only goes through high density regions, then where, where there are a lot of, um, by which I mean, there are a lot of uh, data points, then uh, the approximation to their distance should be good, right? And better than if uh, their shortest path goes through a low density region, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're completely right. We just went with the sort of more or less assuming the usual, which is that uh, the points are more or less, you know, uniformly distributed. Even though our results, in fact, are not as you as you perhaps noticed, the results are not uh, stochastic because we just assume the points to be dense enough. Uh, but yeah, once you once you assume them sampled from a from a density, if the density has uh, much higher values than than others, then of course in those regions you you'll be able to do better in the, in the ones that are dense densely sampled. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Yeah. Very very cool work. And Thank other you. questions from the audience. So I think yeah. Oh, oh, one one just one one thing I wanted to check is like I think in the like probably page thirteen. I think when you mentioned about yeah, there was there was a bound like there's a proposition that you are trying to upper and lower bounds. I think it's in the page thirteen, and yes, you have this con concern that epsilon over r has to be less than equal to one over c one something. I think that bounds. So I think that just uh. I think in this case you probably need a c one to be a constant greater than two because I because I. Your condition doesn't because when you are thinking about using R graph, but you didn't assume it's a complete graph. But in order to ensure it's a complete graph, I think the like yeah, this constant C one I think has to be greater than or equal to two, right? That's because yeah, that would guarantee. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's going to guarantee right. that yeah, that that, that both is going to be a complete graph because I was thinking that oh, in, in the case that if you don't get a complete graph, then the graph distance is going to be like an infinity in certain case. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You're right. Yep. Okay. Great. Oh, there's a uh, one question coming from you couldn't so. So in some of your settings, the points are sitting in the Euclidean space and in which, in which the dis, dis similarity and embedding are known. So, so I'm curious about if the method can be generalized to other graph like the social networks. Yeah, so, so yes. Um, and uh, okay, so then what, what becomes a bit tricky is uh, to understand the consistency of a method, right? Because, um, yeah, so, okay. So in social networks, people look also at the stochastic block model, which is quite, quite different. Uh, here I'm using as a base uh, model, uh, a, uh, essentially what's, what's typically understood as a random geometry graph. So it's one in which uh, the latent position, so-called, are in some Euclidean space. So there's a geometry to it, in fact, a, ge in fact, a Euclidean geometry. For the stochastic block model, which is another one that people have used in uh, networks, uh, social networks in particular, it's one that uh, doesn't really have that, and it's hard to argue that the stochastic block model has a, a Euclidean metric. It's, it's really something else. It's more like points uh, and, um, and like, a, like a noise around them. And those points are in high dimensions. Uh, given by uh, the number of nodes in the graph. Um, so yeah, they can be used. So they have been used more specifically now to your question. Such graphs have been used, uh, for example, in, in uh, link prediction. In fact, I didn't get to it, but in the last part, uh, this one here, uh, that's the uh, latent graph model that I mentioned. Uh, this and this one, the, it's the only when we have the adjacency matrix. So the model is something like this, like the adjacency, uh, sorry, um, nodes i and j are connected, uh, given the position of the points are connected uh, with probability, um, uh, a function of the distance between the two points and the distance uh, that function is decreasing, okay? And it turns out that uh, something like that was considered 
uh, surprisingly to me at least, uh, but we found that uh, before, thankfully, before, when we were the, writing the paper, that, that there are quite a few publications on this in, in link prediction. So, so in principle, people that were interested in the World Wide Web, for example, which, uh, you know, it's hard to argue it's uh, Euclidean, but nonetheless, they were, they had in mind this sort of model somehow. Um, I don't know the history of why they came to that, but again, it, it's sort of hard to avoid, uh, except if you choose something like a stochastic bug model, possibly, or preferential, prefer, preferential attachment model, also maybe another one that people use as, as uh, um, yeah, as a, uh, as a model for social networks. Did I answer the question? Or? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, perhaps like when we're at confusing myself or others, like there is a literature on considering such models uh, for uh, social, and like at least in link prediction, which is not quite social networks, but like the World Wide Web, which is not, it's kind of similar. And, uh, and uh, I don't know, you know, again, there are, there are some competitors out there, such as the stochastic block model and professional attachment model and others like that. Great, great. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah, it's Friday after this, so I think people are very exciting. <laughs> okay, oh, uh, so here's actually another question. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, so uh, yeah, it's just a comment saying that thanks for the answers. And then it seems that the latent graph models are connected to the graph neural network. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, good question. So what is meant by, uh, maybe I don't know this graph neural network, where is that? So, yeah, I think maybe I can allow him, yeah, to, to ask. So hi, Ikun, I think you should be able to directly ask the questions. So I just allowed you to, to, to speak. Thanks. Yeah, actually, uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, actually, when, when you talk about the, the graph, the first intuition that I get is like, it seems that there might be some connections with the graph neural network because the, the graph neural network also use this kind of dis dissimilarity to define a graph and then to construct some like the the kind of of the uh, doing some some let's say that the easy ways to, to do like the spectrum clustering or, but, but it, it can be more advanced than that to do it, to, to quantify some like the spatial uh, connections between the nodes or something like that. So, so it seems to me that the, the last slides that you show about the late, latent graph when you define the phi, it seems that the, it, it, it seems to be defined kind of the, the, the weight between the, uh, between two points. So, so you might be have some connection with the graph neural net network, but I, I'm not sure about that. So I actually, I, I asked it for a question. Oh, that's fine. If you can, can, you, can you tell me what graph neural networks are? Sorry, I, I don't think I've uh, heard that term. In, that yeah, term India, I'm not the expert about that. <laughs> so, so actually, I, I'm just curious if it, it can be like connected with, with something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Yanchi, have you heard of uh, graph neural networks? Well, actually, no, <laughs> so I also cannot. So I, yeah. I think, okay. yeah, Sorry. Yeah. yeah. No, no, it's fine. Like I, I look it up afterwards, but I, I don't know if it, I, I just ignorant about what, what that is, but um, yeah. I don't know if this is the sort of graph graph relation that people uh, consider, but you know, like in deep neural networks, but they're, you know, they're very special, you know, like they move from, typically move from one layer to another. Uh, yeah. Yes, actually, yeah. another thing that it might be related here is like uh, something sometimes, uh, I guess, a few years ago, people also proposed something looks like the graph uh, embedding or something looks like the, the no, no, no to, to wet or something like that. That is like for each, each uh, vertex in the graph, they will assign a kind of representations. So it's, it seems like the, it's just like the setting that, that we have uh, in, in the first, first slide. So about the, for each each node, we will have a, a kind of embedding, but but for their problem, they, they just want to uh, construct their, directly construct the embedding for, for each node. And then for, uh, th this embedding can be used for the downstream analysis. But yeah, it seems like it's quite related to, to the problem that you started here, but, but it's also different, have a different, like the interest in their problem, yeah. And what is the uh, like? What, what are the main keywords in that line of work? Uh, let me. I, I can type that up. I don't know whether you can see there. There's. Uh, 
I don't know if the chat you can you can probably type in the chat. I think that might that might work. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. So something looks like I, I guess the first thing that I mentioned is something called a graph embedding. Um, yeah, so graph embedding is the same yeah. problem I mentioned earlier. Like that's that's one of the words that people use. And also like the node to whack or something like that is oh, something. No. Okay, okay, not to whack. Okay. Yeah, this I have okay, this I have uh seen before, but sorry, I don't have it in mind. Yeah, yeah. It, it looks like they, they're using because for, for each node they're using some like the uh random walk on, on the graph to, to, yeah, to construct yeah. the so embedding. This yeah, this is a method for graph embedding. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's not so graph embedding is a problem then, and then and then node to back is a is a method for graph embedding, which looks like you, you're right. It might be. I'm just looking it up really quickly, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's but. Yeah, but but for neural network actually uh, the graph neural network is actually a quite popular field recently, but actually I, I don't know too much about it. So but it seems that I guess there might be some connection in the in the last pages like the latent graph. Uh, that that you show, but but I'm not sure about that. So actually, I'm just curious about this point. Maybe there will be some interesting connection between them. Yeah. So you know, there are many many methods for this, and um, this seems to be just very briefly. It looks like it's maybe uh, maybe related to uh, what's called diffusion maps. So mm -hmm. like I said, there was, there's a crisscross between MDS and then dimensionality reduction. Mm -hmm. And um, in in the, so diffusion map is for the other side for dimensionality reduction, but it's also based on random walks. And okay. uh, just a very brief description. I'm just reading now. It looks like it's very related to that. But like it wouldn't be surprising if they kind of like you know uh, mirrors of each other, but in a different realm. If that makes sense. So they solve different problems, but uh, somehow there've been a number of crisscrosses like that over the years. Okay. Starting with, in fact, MDS, uh, sorry, classical scaling being uh, closely related to, and sometimes confused with the uh, PCA. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the two are very related. In fact, if you if you compute the pairwise distances and apply classical scaling, is the same as PCA, except that algorithmically, uh, one can mm -hmm. be faster than the other, depending on what, whether the number of nodes is smaller or larger than the dimension, the ambient dimension. Um, yeah. But mm -hmm. otherwise, there are methods for different problems, and it's sometimes they're confused in, uh, in even in, even in textbooks, which is a bit surprising to me. Yeah, yeah, I see, I see. Okay. Yeah. yeah thanks, yeah. thanks for the great talk, actually, and also thanks for your answering. It's actually quite quite interesting and informative about it. Oh, great. Okay, I'm glad you liked it. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we are <laughs> we are over time. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. So yeah, it was a really great talk and thank you so much, Eric. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll Pleasure. meet each other soon in the future in person. <laughs> yeah, let's have, let's have lunch or something or dinner yes. if we find ourselves in the same conference or something like that. I love that. I mean, yes. And then uh, you, you must be up for tenure, right? Uh, probably next mm -hmm. year. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's the, uh, yeah, I'm planning to yeah, apply next, next year. Yeah. Well, given, uh, you know, given what you've done, uh, it should be a no brainer. But anyway, oh, good, yeah. good continuation yeah. and, you know, good luck and to you and, uh, you know, like, especially for younger people like you, I hope like it will normalize so you can enjoy Seattle and uh, the way you were enjoying it uh, before when you arrived, right? Like in a way that's a bit more friendly to humans. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Okay, great. Right. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Okay. Bye. My pleasure, see you, <laughs> thanks. Bye.